Chapter 6 Thursday, June 4, Sup, Th, Slash Sup, 1852 We are still traveling along the North Platte River. Yesterday's rain was a welcome respite from having to drive, and I'm thankful that we had it, though it will put us a day further from finding the elephant. I worry about Penelope and the man who is looking for her. She has learned to shoot, and she is a very capable woman, but I do not know what she will do when he returns. We must make him move along as quickly as we can. Penelope was actually glad to be on their way again the following morning. Having a day off in the middle of the week had been nice, but the sooner they made it across the river, and the fewer rainstorms there were between now and that time, the safer they would all be. She had started to really enjoy her time with the other women, and she could see that along with Betty, Katie, and Mary were going to be special friends to her. It was odd feeling the weight of the pistol in the pocket of her apron as they walked, but it was a good odd. She felt protected. Late into the afternoon, Katie grabbed her arm. Several of us are going to help Mr. Simmons. His wife died a few weeks back, and his clothes were all washed downstream. Are you skilled with a needle? Penelope smiled. I plan to open a dress shop when we reach Oregon. I have plenty of fabric in my wagon. Oh, wonderful. His little girl, Emily, needs some new dresses as well. Perhaps you could sew one of her dresses? Katie seemed excited to be able to coordinate for the small family. Penelope nodded. I would enjoy that. She had always loved to sew, and she thought of the fabric packed in the back of the wagon as the beginning of her business. I'll start on that this evening. I'll send Emily to your fire this evening for you to take measurements. Do you know what her favorite color is? Penelope asked, thinking about the box where she'd stored the fabric. It was deep into the wagon, and she didn't want to have to climb back in there more than once. I don't. I'm sure you can ask her when she comes to see you this evening. I'll do that. Penelope was excited to get started. What will you do when you reach Oregon? She couldn't help but wonder what other women without husbands would do there. Katie shrugged. I am planning to homestead. That was the original plan when we started west, but after my husband's death I wasn't sure I'd be able to do it. But I feel stronger now and I think between me and Stanley, we can figure things out. Good, Penelope said with a smile. Are you settling near the rest of us? I do believe I am. I feel like the people in this company are now my family, and if I can stay close to the rest of you, then I know I'll feel safe. So, does that make us sisters? Katie smiled. I would adore having you for my sister. When they stopped for the evening, Penelope made a simple meal of Johnny cakes and bacon, glad they finally had an evening with no one joining them for their meal. Herb was perfectly content eating the breakfast foods for supper. I appreciate you always doing such a good job cooking for me, Herb said. She smiled, blushing a little. I try hard. I know I'm not the best cook, but it's never because of lack of effort. I know that. I can tell you put your everything into what you do. I do. She finished eating and as she was washing the dishes, little Emily came into camp. Penelope hurried to the wagon and pulled out her measuring tape. Carefully, she measured the girl, jotting down what she needed to remember. What is your favorite color, Emily? Emily scrunched up her face, thinking about it. I like blue. All right. Thank you. As soon as Emily had scurried away, she realized Herb had no idea why the little girl had even come to camp. Emily and her father lost all their clothes in the storm yesterday. They were washed down river. He shook his head. I'm glad it was just clothes and not their food. I am as well. I did agree to make Emily a dress. Everyone is pitching in and making an item of clothing. That will be nice. I'm going to finish the dishes and then get started if you don't mind. I'm anxious to get it ready for her. 
So, you don't want to walk with me this evening? He asked, frowning at her. She made a face. We could take a quick walk, but let me find just the right fabric first. She climbed all the way into the back of the wagon and found her box of precious fabric. This was the last thing she'd want to lose in a sudden storm. She dug through the box and found a pretty light blue fabric that she knew would match the girl's eyes perfectly. She put the cloth at the end of the wagon, but when she went to jump down, Herb caught her by the waist and lifted her to the ground. Let's walk. Penelope smiled. Absolutely. As they left camp, she talked to him about her day, explaining how everyone was coming together to help Mr. Simmons. Emily lost her mother a few weeks back, so there's no one to sew for them. We all feel like a family, so I will sew for the girl. I'll help with her father's clothes as well if I'm needed, of course. Of course. He smiled at her. I didn't know you had so much fabric hidden away in the back of the wagon. He was thrilled she seemed to be prepared for what was to come. She stopped walking for a moment, frowning. I haven't told you my plans for when we reach Oregon, she asked. I want to start a dress shop. I plan on sewing for all of the women and children. I'm very excited about it. He shook his head, a smile lighting up his face. I had no idea. I think that's a great idea, but it might be good if you added in men to sew for. Men need work shirts. Well, that's true, she said thinking about it. I can add men in, but I will probably need to order some more fabrics in. The idea of ordering more fabric was even exciting. She simply loved everything about the idea of being a seamstress, even though she knew her mother would be mortified to think of her daughter working for others. Perhaps that was part of the draw. What about you? Do you have any plans other than starting your blacksmith shop? He shook his head. Well, I think I want to have a stable connected to it. I believe if I have a stable and breed some horses, as well as doing my blacksmithing, I'll make a great deal more money. Do you want to be a rich man? She asked. She'd seen what wealth could do to people and thinking of Herb wanting to be wealthy was a little frightening. He frowned at the question. I don't want to be fabulously wealthy and have people waiting on my every whim but I would like to make a good living for you and any children that may come along. My father was never rich, but I've never seen a happier man. Tell me about your parents, she said, taking his arm and snuggling against him as they walked. You've told me very little about your past, and I've told you everything about mine. You didn't tell me until today that you wanted to own a dress shop. She nodded. I think I was afraid that if I spoke my desires aloud, I'd never be able to make them happen, if that makes any sense. I suppose it does. Your parents, she reminded him. Oh, yes, well, my father is a blacksmith, and he taught me everything I know. He and my mother were childhood sweethearts. She came from a family of great wealth in New York City, and my father was just a blacksmith's son. As soon as they met, they fell in love, and for a time, her father told them they weren't allowed to court, but my mother kept talking to her mother and to her father, telling them what a wonderful man John, my father, was. Eventually, she wore them down, and they gave him some money to start a shop. Oh, I love this story. He chuckled. My father tried to start a shop in New York, but there was just too much competition so they decided to move to Missouri, knowing it was a place that was mostly unsettled at that time, and it would be a good place to start a business. So, after much forethought and planning and saving every day for a few years, they moved to Independence. Shortly after their arrival, I was born. Are you the youngest? she asked. I'm an only child. Mother desperately wanted children, but she wasn't able to have them. Missouri ended up being the place where they needed to be for whatever reason. My parents still see one another, and their faces light up with love. They're going to miss you terribly. Penelope couldn't imagine her only child moving so far away from her. 
they are, but they understand that they followed their dreams and found the perfect place for them to live. Now I need to do the same for myself. I need to find my dreams, and I believe they lie in Oregon. It's like Missouri was when my parents settled there. It's a new area opening up and people will be needing the services of a blacksmith and a livery. I'll provide those services. So really, you're going west to fulfill all your dreams. I am in so many ways. I always wanted to marry and settle down, but I couldn't find anyone who I wanted to marry. As soon as I saw you, I knew that was changing. She smiled at him. I'm glad you felt that way and you kept pursuing me. She went into his arms and kissed him. You are ten times the man Reginald was. The man you were to marry? he asked. Yes, the man my father chose for me. He's wanted us to marry since I was a baby, and it's been dreadful keeping him waiting. She shook her head. I probably shouldn't have waited as long as I did, but I don't care. I wanted to marry someone I could care for and respect. You're that someone. He kissed her forehead before heading back toward camp. Now let's talk about this dress shop of yours. What do you want to say about it? She asked, dreading the idea of him taking it over. I'm curious what you're thinking for it. What will you need to get it started? She shrugged. I'll need a place to live first. I think for a good while, I can work at home, and then eventually, I'll need a building, but that will take a while. Mostly, I just want to be able to help with expenses. I was planning on that and renting my land being my whole income, but now I don't need to. We can still rent your land, but perhaps we should keep mine for the horses I want to raise. It might be smart for me to raise oxen as well. People will need them for plowing. She nodded. That could be very smart. She was excited he was talking about her portion of the land as if it would still be hers. We'll have to think on it. I like the idea of two of the stores in town having the name Jensen on them. What if I want my shop to be called Penelope's Dresses? Then that's what it will be called. Your dress shop is your dream, and I will help you with ideas, but you'll get to make all the decisions. It's not my place to make those decisions for you. You'd really let me make the decisions, she asked, a bit stunned. No one had ever allowed her to make her own decisions about anything. That was a big part of the reason she wanted to go west so badly. The decisions are yours to make. You need to follow your dream, not mine. As I said, I'll make suggestions, but you don't have to agree with them. And I would love if you'd help me with suggestions. That's how my parents' marriage was. A partnership, and that's what I want from ours as well. In that moment, her heart leapt. She'd known he was much better for her than her father or Reginald, but the idea that he would let her make her own decisions about business matters told her that she'd chosen to marry the right man. As soon as they got back to camp, he erected their tent while she started the painstaking process of cutting out the dress she'd make for Emily. It wasn't easy to do on the ground, but she found a large piece of oil cloth she used to keep the fabric clean as she worked with it. Just as it was getting to be too dark to see, she had the dress cut out and ready to sew. She'd spend every spare moment on it until it was done, and then see if she could make something else. Why, she could make a little money by taking and mending as they traveled. Perhaps her jewelry could be handed down to her daughter instead of having to be sold to start their businesses. She still had no idea if Herb had anything saved, or if he was just going to do what he could with the land he received from the government, but it didn't matter much to her. She could help others, and so could he. That was what life was going to be about for them. She carefully folded the dress pieces and put them in the back of the wagon, before climbing into the tent. Herb was lying on his side, sleeping soundly, and she snuggled into his arms, trying not to wake him. His eyes opened and he rubbed a hand from her shoulder down to her wrist. I think I'm needing to feel a little affection from my wife. She laughed softly. I was thinking along those lines, and I agree. 
A whole lot of affection would be nice tonight. Penelope kissed him, her hands touching him in ways she didn't know if she should, but when he didn't stop her, she grew bolder. Her life was so much different than she'd imagined it would be after she'd married. There were no slaves. She worked a great deal harder than she'd ever thought she would, but the work was good, and she was married to a good man. What more could a young lady ask for? Afterward, Herb lay there while she fell asleep, thinking about what he could do to show his love for her. He didn't feel like they'd had enough time to just court, and he wanted to find a way to court his wife. There had to be something he could do to show her she was the most special woman he'd ever met. It was hard with most days being the same on their journey, but there was a way. Maybe he should talk to her friend Betty, or even Mrs. Gabriel. She seemed to understand Penelope in ways he didn't. After breakfast the next morning, Herb went in search of Mrs. Gabriel. Hopefully, she would have some ideas for a nice romantic way for them to spend their evening. Mrs. Gabriel? The woman turned from her fire. Yes, Mr. Jensen? I was hoping for a little advice if you don't mind. He was embarrassed to be asking, but he needed a woman's perspective. Of course, I don't mind. What's troubling you? I am looking for a way to court my wife. A way that will be easy on the trail. I want to show her a romantic evening tonight, but there will be no music, so we can't dance. She smiled at him, nodding. Pick her some flowers, tell her that she doesn't have to cook. I'll make a meal for you both, and you can pick it up on your way to see her. That's a good idea. I can pay you a penny for your troubles. No, I'm doing this as a friend. Then take her on a long walk by the river. Talk to her and tell her your feelings. Herb's eyes widened. She's not ready to hear my feelings. Mrs. Gabriel laughed. I've seen how she looks at you. Trust me. She's ready to hear whatever you want to say. As Herb walked away from her, he wandered back to Penelope. Don't cook supper tonight, he said. Penelope frowned at him. Why not? We need to eat. I've made other arrangements, he said, and then he went to hitch up the team. Penelope stared after him, wondering what he was planning. It was something, and she wanted to know. She'd never been good at waiting for surprises. She'd always wanted to know what was going to happen early. As soon as they were on their way, Penelope fell into line with the other women. She felt excited to know what was happening with their supper that evening. Whatever it was, she'd have a little more time to work on Emily's dress. She had two of the pieces with her as they walked, and she worked on basting them. It wasn't the easiest thing she'd ever done, walking and sewing, but it would be worth it to have it done as quickly as she possibly could. Emily skipped along beside her, looking at the fabric in her hands. Is that my dress? Penelope nodded. Do you like the color? Yes. That's the prettiest blue in all the world. Emily spread her arms wide. I think so too, Penelope said with a smile. I hope you'll be happy with your dress. I want a pretty dress with a skirt that goes out around me. I'm not sure if a hoop skirt would be good for a girl your age on the trail. Penelope was certain it wouldn't, actually, but she didn't want to crush the girl either. Oh. Well, if you don't think I should have them, then that will be fine. Maybe when we get to Oregon, you could make me a hoop skirt. Penelope laughed. Maybe I will. We'll talk to your father about that when we get closer. By the time they stopped for lunch, she'd managed to baste the pieces together. It was something she could have sewed in an hour normally, but while walking the slow pace of the oxen, it was a lot more time-consuming. But what a good way to use her time and not worry about the walking they were constantly doing. For lunch, they had cold Johnny cakes from the night before, and she sat on a quilt on the ground with some of the other women, and Herb joined her. She had two more pieces of the dress ready to baste while she ate, and she hoped to use the time they were allotted to rest after the noon meal to work on the dress as well. 
That's coming along, Herb said, nodding to the pieces of dress in her hand. It will as long as I have time to work on it, she said with a smile. I do look forward to having it finished for Emily. Just think, once we're in Oregon, you'll get to sew even more. Do you think you'll specialize in day dresses or nice dresses for parties? I hope to do a little of both, she responded. Hannah seemed to pick up the conversation. Are you planning to start a dress shop, Penelope? I am. I'm actually really excited about it. I've always enjoyed sewing and needlepoint. She didn't add that she'd been taught to sew by a slave whose daughter had been her closest friend and confidant, because that was knowledge no one needed. And it still hurt to think of Muriel. You do beautiful work, Hannah said, lifting a portion of the pieces. Your stitches are so straight and perfect. Mine are always a little crooked. My mother gave up trying to teach me to do better. I was a lost cause. Penelope laughed. I have always enjoyed it a great deal, and my mother would make me sit with her for hours every day doing needlepoint. I'm not quite as fond of needlepoint as I am of sewing, but I still enjoy it. I like to make little flowers on sleeves of my dresses. She showed Hannah her sleeve. She'd never been allowed to make her own clothes, because that was not work for a lady, but she'd made several dresses for the slaves of the plantation. Just never where her mother would see her. Oh, that flower is beautiful. I would love you to do something like that for me. I would enjoy that. Penelope smiled. I'm going to finish this first, though. I'm in no hurry. I just think it would be fun to have something like that. Hannah shrugged. Maybe a pastor's wife shouldn't be so vain as to want flowers on her sleeves. There's nothing wrong with it, Penelope assured her. Back in Virginia, our pastor's wife wore silks to church every week. She wore what she was given by the wives of her husband's congregants, and they all wore silks. She remembered her mother once telling her that a lady must never be seen in the same dress twice. It had seemed ridiculous at the time, and it seemed even more ridiculous now. I think that would be lovely, Hannah said, smiling. I have a feeling I won't be given cast-off silks in Oregon, though. No, but perhaps if you'd like, Herb and I could tithe with clothing for you. Herb jerked against her, and she looked at him, not quite understanding what was wrong. She would need to be sure to ask him later. I'd like that a lot. Or I can just give you dresses to embroider. Either way. I'm excited to have a dressmaker that will be a part of our little community. I hope I live up to expectations. Penelope was surprised that anyone would show an interest already, but she was pleased. And she decided she would embroider something small and pretty on Emily's dress. The girl would be a walking advertisement for her. As they finished their break, and Penelope went back to the wagon to get more pieces to baste, she asked Herb what had bothered him about her offering to tithe with a dress. I feel like it'll be my responsibility to feed and clothe us and tithe. Herb frowned at her. I like the idea of you having a business, but not if you use it just to pay the bills. She sighed. What will I use it for then? The money you make will be our money, so the money I make will be our money as well, won't it? I never thought of it that way, he said. I suppose that's true. Good, then don't worry about things like that. There's enough going on in our lives to worry about. Don't you think? He nodded. You're right. Are you still wearing your apron and keeping the pistol in your pocket? He asked. I am. I won't let anyone come near me. I promise. Good. He smiled at her, kissing her forehead. I hate that I can't watch over you every second. I don't need to be watched every second. I'm doing just fine. The other women are there, and Mary always has her musket. Then I will stop borrowing trouble and start driving toward Oregon. She smiled. We'll get there much faster that way. Chapter 7 
June 5, sup, th, slash sup, 1852. I love that I have something to work toward on this never-ending journey of ours. Making a dress for a little motherless child has made me feel as if I'm doing something good with my time and not just plodding along toward a place that might never appear. It makes me feel good about myself that I have a skill that's needed by someone. All of my life I've been told to sit down and look pretty, but there's more to me than looking pretty, and people are starting to see that finally. I feel blessed that I've stepped into this new world full of people who have to fight for everything they have and don't have things handed to them on a silver platter. I feel like I belong here so much more than I ever felt as if I belonged at home. I feel as if I've found where I belong, and it's wherever this wonderful group of people that I'm with is. Whether it's in a camp in Independence, Missouri, or in the middle of the Great Plains somewhere. I'm where I should be. By suppertime, Penelope was very curious about whatever it was Herb had planned, but she used her time wisely to continue basting the dress for little Emily. As she sat working on it, Emily came to visit again. Will this be my skirt? It will. Do you like it? Penelope held it up for the little girl to see. I wish there were butterflies on it, Emily said, looking sad. Do you like butterflies? I love them. My mama always said butterflies were the best of all insects, because they look pretty, and they help make flowers grow. Penelope smiled. Your mother sounds like a very smart woman. She was very smart, said a young girl who must have been around 15. She was odd-looking with a peppermint stick coming out of the top of her dress. I liked her. She taught me how to make a couple of things over the fire. Someday, I'm going to be the best cook in all of the world. Penelope nodded. And you are? The girl pulled the peppermint stick from her cleavage and sucked on one end of it. I'm Edna Blue. People think I'm strange, but I just understand a lot of things. I think you and your new husband are going to make beautiful children. With that the girl walked away. Penelope looked at Emily. Do you think she's odd? Emily nodded emphatically. Yes, but she's nice, so it's all right by me that she's a little strange. Emily hurried off to play, and Penelope eyed the fabric she was using. It was a solid color fabric and Penelope knew she could easily add a butterfly, or two. She smiled as she thought about just where they should go. She was so involved in her dressmaking that she didn't notice when Herb came up to their fire and presented her with a beautiful bouquet of wildflowers. Where did these come from? She hadn't even noticed any flowers around to pick. He smiled. I found them after I saw to the livestock. She took the flowers from him and inhaled deeply of their aroma. They're beautiful. Thank you for being such a thoughtful husband. You wait there. I'll be right back. Penelope thought the man was acting odd, but she didn't mind. She went back to her sewing, determined to have the dress done before services on Sunday afternoon. She knew that Emily would be very proud to wear her new butterfly dress to church. When Herb returned, there was a large pot dangling from his hand with a wonderful smell emanating from it. Where did you get that? she asked, more than a little surprised. Mrs. Gabriel agreed to make supper, so you could have an evening off from cooking, he said. He opened the pot and his taste buds sat up to take notice. Apparently, Mrs. Gabriel was a wonderful cook. It smells so good. I have a feeling it will taste even better, he said. He set the pot down and got them each a dish, serving up the rice and the bits of meat cooked through it. When she stood up to help, he waved her away. No, I'm doing for you tonight. She smiled, surprised that he was acting so infatuated. He'd never been this way with her before. Thank you. You're very welcome, he said. He handed her a plate with her food on it as well as a fork, and they both ate. I'm hoping to take you on a walk this evening. I know you're working on the dress, but I think a nice romantic walk along the river is what we both need. 
he really needed her to agree for the rest of the evening he had planned. He was surprised just how much he was enjoying courting her this way. It sounds lovely. He washed the dishes while she sewed, and she wanted to laugh at how ineptly he did it. He was definitely not used to washing dishes any more than she was. As soon as he was finished, she put her sewing into the back of the wagon, and she took his arm to walk with him. As they strolled through camp, she realized they'd done the same thing just a week before, surprising everyone. Now no one thought a thing of it. Were they an old married couple now? She didn't know, but she did know she enjoyed walking with him a great deal. Well, she enjoyed everything she did with him. It was strange just how much fun she had when they were together. As they walked, he told her how pretty she was, and she blushed. You already have me as a wife, Herb. You don't need to try to court me. That's the thing, he said. I never had a chance to court you because we married so quickly, but I don't want you to look back at your life and be sad you weren't properly courted by your husband. So, I'm going to do my best to make up for it. He hoped his explanation would tell her how very much she meant to him. I see that. She smiled up at him. I could never feel like I missed out on anything with you beside me, Herb. You've truly helped me feel like I belong in this camp, and I know without a doubt that I belong in your arms. He smiled at her words, stopping then and leaning down to kiss his wife. They were still within sight of camp, and he rarely kissed her where people could see, but in that moment, it felt right. And I feel like my arms belong around you. She grinned. Well, then we're both happy, aren't we? Definitely. I never imagined I could feel this happy. He struggled for the right words as they began walking again. My whole life I've been watching my parents and praying every night that God would send me a woman I could love the way my father loved my mother. And then I saw you in Independence, and I knew you were the woman I'd been praying for. She sniffled as a tear touched her cheek. You say the most wonderful things, Herb. I'll be praying that my daughters will someday marry a man just like you. A man who can make them feel loved and cared for in any situation. She didn't know what she'd done to deserve a man like him, but she was so glad to have him. Do you really feel that way? he asked. Of course, I do. You brought me flowers, arranged to have supper made, and you brought me for a walk and told me so many wonderful things. How could I feel anything but loved with you around? She shook her head. When I was a girl, my tutor would tell me about the Knights of the Round Table and I would listen with rapt attention. I decided then that I wouldn't marry until I found my own knight. It was a silly thing to decide, and I was young, so you have to forgive that, but I do feel like you are the knight I spent my whole life looking for. You're the man who God made just for me. She rested her head on his shoulder for a moment. Thank you for coming into my life and changing the wheel on my wagon a week ago. Do you realize everything changed that day? He smiled. I do, and I think it's a good thing. I will do everything I can to make sure you feel like we're courting. I appreciate that. But then I appreciate all you do for me every day. I hope you know that. He nodded. I do. And I will try to change my thinking about how we use the money you earn with your dress shop. I hope you're not one of those women who wants to have a huge house with servants. Not at all. I lived with that as a child, but as an adult, I want to see things around me that were purchased with things I earned myself. And things I earned, he asked. Of course. Anything one of us earns we both do. She smiled up at him, and then looked out over the river. How long until we cross? As soon as we can. We should be able to cross within a week, from what I understand. Are you worried? she asked, sensing something in his voice. Conversations like this are not what I was expecting when I took you for a long romantic walk. Please, Herb. I know there's something you're not telling me. The rainstorm may make it harder than it would have been to cross, 
and this and a place called Bear River are the two most dangerous crossings we'll have on the entire journey. He shook his head. I'll be taking the wheels off each wagon and reassembling them on the other side. No one is going to risk me in any way, but many men have been lost on this crossing. She frowned up at him. So, any of my friends could lose her husband here? Any of them. I know it's not what you want to hear, and I don't want to say it. Thankfully, we have a good doctor and a good preacher with us on this journey. I think we're going to be all right. I'll still worry. How could I not? He sighed. And this is why I didn't want to have this discussion with you. Well, now that we've had it, what can I do to help lower the risk? Not a thing, he said. You'll need to stay out of the way. We may have to build canoes to get across or the company in front of us may leave some behind, but whatever it takes, that's what we'll do. Penelope nodded, taking a deep breath. Are we worried about the oxen? He shrugged. I'm not nearly as worried about losing oxen as I am about losing people. There are plenty of oxen. No human life is worth less than the best of the oxen. She stood looking out across the river, which looked so calm there to her. Couldn't we cross here? Now, where it's calm? There are undercurrents here. The safest place to cross is still a few days' walk from here. We'll make sure we cross at the safest place. I promise. He wrapped his arms around her from behind, standing and staring out over the water with her. And you promise not to be noble and risk your life for someone else's? I promise that I will do my best to survive no matter what. You and any children we may have keep me motivated to keep going every day. What have I done in my life to deserve marriage to a man like you? She asked, finally voicing what she'd been thinking. You were born. That's enough for me. You have the kindest heart of anyone I've ever known. Your story about Muriel is enough to tell me that. She nodded. I would have brought Muriel with me if she was still alive. I don't care what anyone said. She deserved to be a free woman. Tell me about her. She leaned back against him as she let the memories wash over her. Now, with the sun setting and in this beautiful place on the river, she knew it was the right time to talk about her friend. She loved to play tricks on me. Not big tricks, but silly little things to make me laugh. One day, I looked at my school paper, and she'd written her name on top of it, and crossed mine out. She understood arithmetic much better than I ever could, and she would help me with my numbers every day. She shook her head. My mother liked to tell me that slaves were like animals and we should treat them that way, but no animal could ever do sums in his head the way Muriel did. And she loved to tell stories. I think she heard them from her mother. She would tell stories of what it was like back in Africa, and what the ocean crossing was like in chains. I know someone had to tell her about them, but when she told me, I could almost see her there, chained below deck with the rest of her people. She sounds like a very special person. Oh, she was. And when we played games together, she never let me win. I would hear her mother tell her that the whites always had to win, but she refused to put up with that. And she was pretty. She had the most beautiful eyes you've ever seen. So dark and soulful. Penelope sighed. It feels good to talk about her. Even after she died, my mother wouldn't let me speak of her and she had Muriel's mother sent to the fields to work, so I couldn't talk to her either. Everyone wanted me to pretend that she had never existed, and I just couldn't do that. Not at all. He pulled her closer against him, his hands moving up and down her arms. It sounds to me like you really loved her. He didn't know many women who could love a slave with everything inside them the way she did. She was a miraculous woman in so many ways. Of course, I did. I once asked my mother if she was my twin, because we were born on the same day, and we both nursed from the same woman. It made my mother very angry. I'm sure it did. Tell me about your mother. 
Penelope sighed. She was, well, she was the perfect southern lady. She did as she was told when she was told. She never thought for herself except where her jealousy over me was concerned. She hated Mabel, that was Muriel's mother's name, with everything inside me, for stealing me away from her. She shook her head. I never felt that Mabel was my mother, though. She was Muriel's mother, but I did love her very much. Mabel is a good woman. You said you have a brother, right? I have a younger brother. He's being groomed to be the same type of man my father is. Seth is his name. He's twelve, and he truly is a good person, until he spends time around father. I told him about Muriel and explained it all. He held my hand while I cried. And then father filled his head with lies about how slaves aren't really people, and he came to me and told me it was time for me to grow up and stop talking about a dead slave. She shook her head. I think in a year or two, he will be unrecognizable. That's terrible. I'm so sorry. I went and saw Mabel the day I left. I gave her the engagement ring Reginald had given me. I knew I would never want to look at it again, and it could help her. I told her to get away and sell it so she could be free. I don't know if she did it, but I hope so. Herb smiled at that. Here you are, starting a small revolution all on your own. You really are a rebel, little wife. She laughed. I try to do what's right. If that makes me a rebel, then I can very proudly say that's exactly what I am. Slavery needs to be ended, and it needs to happen yesterday. No one should own another person that way. It's not right. And I think if the slaves want to return to Africa and go back to living the way they lived there, they should be allowed to do so, and they should be given free passage on a ship back. I'm not sure it could work that way, but it should. I see you have very strong opinions about this. I do. Do you have strong opinions about anything? I have strong opinions about the rights of women. I don't think you should have ever been told you had to marry a man you didn't love. You should have had that choice. That's one of the reasons the West is so appealing to me. I want to be able to live in a land where I know my daughters will be allowed to own land and be people in their own rights. I like that opinion, Penelope said with a grin. Do you know Margaret Pruitt's story? No, I don't. I know she was a widow. He wasn't sure what Margaret had to do with their discussion. Yes, her husband of six years died and left her with Amanda and Sally, but his land immediately went to his closest male relative so she wasn't even allowed to stay and attempt to farm on her own. Instead, she had to find a new place to live. She thought about moving herself and her girls back into her parents' home, but they made it clear they would be looking for a husband for her. She wasn't ready to marry, so she decided to come west instead. She sold everything she had of value so she could buy the oxen and the wagon. That's the kind of thing I mean. Women should have the right to own land. If you hadn't had a brother, what would have happened to your father's land when you died? Reginald, she spat. His father and my father have been close friends for years, and when I was born, they started talking about a wedding between us. Herb frowned. So, you've known you were supposed to marry him your entire life? I have. And I have never liked it. Not one little bit. As a child, he was a bully. He would push me down and steal my dolls. When we were engaged, my mother told me I had to start letting him kiss me, and I just kept turning my cheek. There was no way his lips were going to touch mine. She shook her head. No matter how many times I told my mother how mean Reginald was, she would just tell me I had to obey my father. I'm glad he never kissed you. I don't want to have to kill him. She laughed. You are a silly man. Neither of us are ever going to Virginia to kill anyone. You're right, but I could dream about it. Let's head back, she said. I love it that you're courting me so sweetly, 
but I need to work on that dress a little more. She turned in his arms and kissed him. Thank you for wooing me. I didn't realize how special something like this would feel. He bowed low over her hand, kissing her knuckles. Would you accompany me to the dance on Saturday night? Oh, must I choose between that and laundry? I'm not sure I can make such a difficult decision. This is one decision I will make for you. You are coming to the dance with me, and that's that. Well, if you're taking the decision out of my hands, I must conform to your husbandly wishes. She tried not to smile as she thought about avoiding laundry for several hours while she had fun. He offered her his arm with a flourish. Now I know how to get my way with you. Has that been a problem so far in our marriage? Well, no, but there will come a day, I'm certain, the grin he gave her let her know he was only joking. She liked this light-hearted side of him. It was something she'd rarely seen before. When they got back to camp, he got his Bible out of the back of the wagon and read to her from Proverbs 31. This will teach you to be a good wife to me. If I'm not already there, I'm afraid I'm probably not going to improve a great deal. Quiet and listen, wife. I'm listening. And he read, verse after verse, and she listened, looking for ways she could be a better wife to him. She knew he was joking, but he'd been everything she'd needed since the day she'd met him, and she wanted to provide him with what he needed in a wife as well. As she sewed together the bodice of the little dress, she thought about where her butterflies would need to go, and she decided one right in the front, and then a smaller one on each sleeve. If she worked late into the night by lamplight, she could have it done in time for the dance on Saturday. As soon as Herb was done reading, she asked if he would mind if she stayed up late and worked by lantern light. On the dress? Is there a hurry? I'd like to have it ready for Emily to wear to the dance tomorrow night. She is so excited about it, and she just lost her mother, I guess I want to make her feel better in the only way I know how. Then I don't mind at all. Would you like me to sit up with you? He asked. No, but thank you. You need your rest, and I'm being silly pushing myself to get it done. He leaned over and kissed her cheek as he walked toward the tent. Not silly at all. You're being a caring person, and I think it's one of your very best qualities. Penelope sat beside the fire and kept sewing as fast as her fingers would go thinking about her husband's words, and realizing they were true. She did care. Perhaps too deeply sometimes, but she truly cared about everyone around her. It was why she hadn't been able to tolerate cruelty in any way. Why she had hated slavery with everything inside her. She cared about the slaves as much as she cared about her own people. Why wouldn't she? They were humans too. She was certain if everyone had a similar experience to the one she'd had, where she had gotten to know a slave so personally, they would all feel the same. And she wondered if she wrote out her experience and tried to have a newspaper publish it, after they were in Oregon, if perhaps it might make a difference in the way some people looked at slaves. If it did, maybe she could truly do something about the horrors she'd seen. If not, it would only cost her a few hours' time and lots of tears to get it all on paper. She'd ask Herb for his opinion the next day, but as she sat and sewed, she could see her hand on the paper, and she thought about the exact words she would use. I was the daughter of a slave owner, and the best friend of a slave. I suckled at the breast of a woman who was born in Africa. I lost the sister of my heart when I was ten, when my father decided we were too close, and he sold her to another man. Sold her simply to get her out of my life. In the years since I have been without my sweet Muriel, I have thought about how similar we are. There were two differences between me and my friend. She and I were both owned in much the same way by my father. But she had dark skin, whereas mine is light. And she was of a different station in life. She was supposed to wait on me, and I was supposed to allow it. And I did allow it some of the time. She was just as bright, if not brighter than I was. I taught her to read and to do arithmetic. 
She taught me to sew. I taught her how to write her name. And she taught me how to truly love another person as much as is possible in our fleshly bodies. I will always miss my friend, Muriel, and I hope that after you hear her story, you will understand my hatred of the evil practice of slavery that half of our nation participates in. I hope you will tell everyone who will lend their ear about how people of African descent are the same as we are. And more than anything, I hope you will join me in praying for my sweet friend Muriel's soul. Chapter 8 Saturday, June 6, SUP, TH, slash SUP, 1852 I had decided to forego my place, playing my fiddle, with the others, for the Saturday night dances, until I know my wife is safe. She means so much more to me than any instrument ever could. I must watch over her as long as I know this thread is hanging over her. I expect Mr. Bradford to be back for her at any time, and I pray no one in our camp will let on that she's here. We hope to cross the river on Monday, if no rains come before then. We will be at the safe crossing place tonight, but we may have to wait out storms or wait for the river to go down for a day or two. The weather looks clear, and Mr. Applegate says that his farmer's almanac predicts clear skies for the next few days. I pray the almanac is right. Penelope sewed while she cooked breakfast on Saturday morning, and she spent the day sewing as she walked. She'd been able to embroider the pieces of the butterfly in place by lamplight the previous evening, and she was working on hemming the project. She desperately wanted Emily to be able to wear it for the dance that evening, and her fingers moved as quickly as they could to finish. While they ate their cold lunch, her fingers sewed. While her husband rested beside her, she kept going. She talked to the other women, many of whom were working on projects for Emily or her father, while she worked, and it was a pleasant way to pass the time as much of the camp snoozed around them. Finally, as they finished their day's track, she made the last stitch, with barely no time to spare. She held up the dress to look at it critically, but she found nothing that bothered her. It was perfect. She went to the wagon to start their fire for the evening, and Emily came over. What are you cooking? the little girl asked. She peered at the fire curiously. I'm making some beans and rice tonight, but I put a little bacon in with the beans to make them taste better. Penelope felt dejected at the very idea of eating beans again, but she was sure it was worse for the little girl. She wasn't sure if Emily's father could even cook. Emily sighed dramatically. I'm sick of eating beans. Penelope leaned toward the little girl. Do you want to know a secret? Emily nodded, her eyes excited. What? I didn't like beans even before we left Independence, and I hate them even more now. Penelope made a face. Emily giggled. That's not a secret. That's just a fact. That's true. Do you want to know a real secret then? Emily nodded. Yes. I finished your dress. The little girl squealed and clapped her hands. Where is it? Penelope went to her wagon and got the dress from the back of it, holding it up. I just like how it turned out so much, I think I might have to keep it and wear it myself. It's too little. Emily walked over and carefully studied the dress. There are butterflies, she said in a whisper. I thought a few butterflies would be good so you could always remember to pray for your mama. What do you think? Emily hugged both Penelope and the dress. It's the most beautiful dress I've ever seen. I'm so glad you like it. Do you want me to help you put it on? Penelope asked, thrilled with how the little girl was reacting to the dress she'd worked so hard on. Yes, please. When Emily was wearing the pretty new dress, she spread her arms to both sides and spun in a circle, and her skirt swirled out around her. You did make me a pretty skirt that spreads out when I spin. Penelope nodded. I tried to make exactly what you wanted. I have to go and show my papa. Of course, you do. Trudy walked over then, smiling down at the little girl as she ran off. 
That's the only kid in the whole camp I can tolerate. She's just so sweet, I can't imagine anyone not liking her. She is very sweet, Penelope said. How was your day? It was good. Very long, but good. I'm ready to rest tonight and tomorrow. This day off is something I look forward to all week. As do I. Penelope looked at her. Would you like to go to the dance with Herb and I this evening? You don't have to dance, but it's fun to enjoy the music. Trudy frowned. No one wants me at the dance. I do. I think we could become friends with just a little bit of effort, Penelope said. I would love to have a chance to sit and listen to the music with you and just get to know you better. I told you, I'm not answering any questions about my past. Trudy crossed her arms over her chest, making it clear her stance wasn't about to change. Then I'll only ask questions about the present and future, Penelope said automatically. She could see Trudy needed a friend, but she would need to be met on her own terms. I guess that's all right then. Trudy didn't seem convinced, but Penelope was pleased she'd agreed. I should go and fix myself some supper. I made enough to feed an extra mouth if you care to join us. Trudy looked torn. No, I should eat alone. If I'm around people too long, I get snappy, and no one needs to see that. All right. Penelope watched Trudy walk away, and while she wondered what the other woman was hiding, she didn't feel the need to ask. She knew that Trudy had her reasons for not talking about her past, and whatever they were, they were valid. When Herb joined her a short while later for their meal, he asked if she was excited about the dance. Of course, she said. Trudy is going to sit with us. She wants to go, but she doesn't want anyone asking her any questions. What do you think she's so secretive about, he asked. I have no idea. I wonder, like you do, but I'm not going to speculate or try to figure it out. Penelope felt the need to respect the other woman's privacy. I think that's wise. He accepted the bowl she handed him. I'm glad you're befriending her. I know how hard it is for her to trust anyone not to pry too much. It is, but she's got her right to privacy. Penelope didn't want the whole world to know that she ran away from an engagement, so she understood that the other woman probably had something in her past she didn't want to share. Just as you do, he said softly. Will you wear your pistol to the dance tonight? Of course, I will. It's how I keep myself safe after all. I'm there to keep you safe, he reminded her. He wondered for a brief moment if she trusted him. I know you are. But I like to do for myself as much as I can. I know you do. I'm pleased you're wearing it because I might need to step away for a moment. Good. Because I plan to wear it until I no longer feel as if I'm in danger. I think that's a really good idea, Herb said. Beans for supper? She nodded. We haven't had them in over a week, and I hate beans, so I need to spread them out as much as we can. He laughed. I didn't know you hated beans. They're a staple for this trip. There was no other way to survive than eating beans. They are, and I'm making them, and I'll pretend they're something else with every bite. Penelope sighed as she looked into the pot. I wish there was a way to make them taste better. Perhaps you should take some time to talk to Margaret Pruitt about that. She did some wonderful things with spices for beans. He shrugged. She's a really good cook, and I'm certain she wouldn't mind sharing some of her secrets. I'll do that. Maybe she can help me not hate them any longer. I think everyone on this journey will hate them by the end, he said, accepting the bowl of beans she handed him. They look delicious. She wrinkled her nose and sat beside him. I suppose I should be happy that I have food, right? Back home, we always had delicious meals. Now that I'm expected to cook them, it's just not the same. As they ate, she told him about Emily's reaction to the dress she'd made, and he smiled. 
you put butterflies on it? I didn't even notice you doing that. He wondered if she had any idea just how miraculous he found everything about her, including her way to help a little girl remember the love she had for her mother. That's because I worked most of the night to put them on there while you slept, she said. When you see her in it, you'll have to tell me what you think. After she finished the dishes, they headed to the big open area in the middle of the campsite where they would have their church service the next day, but tonight, it would be where the music would be played and where the entire company would dance. Many of the women wore their fanciest dresses, and many of the men wore their best suits. Penelope was too tired to change, but she vowed she would for the next music night. They all tired of wearing the same clothes day in and day out, so they made sure they enjoyed themselves on the one night a week set aside for pleasure. They sat on a long bench that had been carved by a previous company that looked weathered. It was probably built a few years before, but not too many, because people hadn't been traveling this way for long, except maybe Indians, and the Indians didn't usually sit on things. The ground worked well enough for them. The musicians were just tuning up, and Jamie Pruitt, Margaret's husband, called out to them. You should join us again soon, Herb. It's not the same playing without you. Hopefully, I'll be back next week. Herb called back, putting his arm around Penelope's shoulders. Trudy came to sit on the other side of Penelope, and she smiled at her. I hadn't been here for the music before last week. It's fun to watch people dance and to join in if you feel like it. I won't be joining, Trudy said, but I'll watch and enjoy the music. She had a faraway look in her eyes. Have you been to many dances? Penelope asked. That's a question about my past. Why don't you ask if I plan to go to a lot of dances in the future? Trudy smiled to let Penelope know she wasn't angry, but she was simply not going to answer that type of question, which was good enough for Penelope. Do you think you'll enjoy this dance? Penelope asked, grinning at Trudy. I'm going to do my very best, Trudy responded. As others started to join them, Emily brought her father, whom she was dragging by his hand. Papa, this is Mrs. Jensen. She made my blue butterfly dress. Emily was wearing the dress, and Penelope had been right. It matched her eyes perfectly. Trudy smiled at the child. Oh, look at that dress. The stitchwork is amazing. She looked at the tiny butterflies adorning it. I can't imagine anyone who could do better. It's the prettiest dress in the whole world, Emily said. Watch. She spun in a circle and the skirt swirled out around her. Trudy clapped her hands. The prettiest dress for the prettiest little girl in the world. Penelope smiled at the sad-looking man. It's nice to meet you, Mr. Simmons. If there's anything I can do for you, let me know. She couldn't imagine the grief he must be going through, added to the responsibility of being both mother and father to a girl Emily's age. It had to be overwhelming. He shook his head. Thank you, though. I believe I have some new clothes being made now. And for your meals? How are you handling those? Penelope asked, determined to invite them to eat with them if there was no one else doing that for them. I'll take care of their meals from now on, Trudy said, surprising Penelope. Emily is my favorite little girl in all the world, after all. That makes it my place to help them. Of course, it does, Penelope said, smiling at her friend. I can't ask for charity, Mr. Simmons said, holding up a hand. Emily groaned. Papa, you don't know how to make anything but beans. Please let Miss Trudy help us. Mr. Simmons looked down at his daughter. It's enough that we let the nice ladies make clothes for us. Trudy shook her head at Mr. Simmons. I'm not offering you charity. I'm offering to cook the food you have for you, and I will eat it with you. It's just a way to help out, since I'm already cooking anyway. It's as easy to cook for three as it is for two. He frowned for a moment and finally nodded. That would be fine. 
Just be certain that you let us know if we become a burden. Emily squealed and hugged her father and then Trudy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you had ever eaten food Papa made, you'd understand why we need help so badly. Trudy laughed, her face lighting up with a hug. I'm happy to help you. We'll have to talk, and you can tell me your favorite trail foods, and I'll try to cook them as much as I can. No beans. Emily said. I'll have to cook beans sometimes, Trudy told her, but I'll try not to make them too much. I guess that will be all right, Emily said, taking her father's hand and dragging him away. Penelope smiled at Trudy. That was very kind of you to offer to help them that way. Trudy shrugged. I really do like Emily. She's such a sweet little thing. Having her at my fire every evening may make it, so I'm not always in such a sour mood. Penelope wanted to ask more questions, but she knew she shouldn't. It wasn't the right time. Perhaps there never would be a right time. Did you know many of the people of our company are planning to settle near each other once we reach Oregon and find a good place? Trudy shook her head. I had no idea. Perhaps you'll move near us as well. We'll have a preacher, a doctor, a blacksmith, and I'll be opening a dress shop. What more could you need in life? Trudy smiled. I think I may do that. You are the first person I've been able to call a friend in a long while. I'm glad you call me friend, because that's exactly how I think of you, Penelope said. The music started then, making it harder to talk, but Penelope was thrilled that her discussion with Trudy had gone so well. She had never expected the other woman to call her a friend. Margaret Pruitt and her daughters sat in front of them on another bench a short while later. Penelope leaned forward. Margaret, do you know my friend, Trudy? Margaret shook her head, turning around to smile at Trudy. It's good to meet you. Where are you from? Trudy opened her mouth, but Penelope decided to answer for her. She doesn't like to think about the past. She is focusing on the present and future. Margaret nodded. I think that's fine. We should all do more of that. Trudy looked a little stunned that Penelope had jumped in to keep her from having to answer, but it obviously pleased her. I'm looking forward to homesteading when I get to Oregon. Will you settle near the rest of us? Margaret asked. I'm hoping the men keep up these wonderful musical nights once we get there. I do miss our fiddle though. As she said the last sentence, she looked at Herb. It was a very deliberate hint that he needed to return to playing. Herb laughed. I promise I'll play again soon. You'd better, Margaret said. Trudy smiled at the play between the others. I would love to settle near everyone else if people want me there. You're wanted. If you're a friend of Penelope's, then I already feel like I can call you friend. Thank you, Trudy said softly. Penelope smiled. I'm glad that's settled. Now, Margaret, I need some help from you. What do you add to your beans to keep them from tasting like sawdust? Margaret smiled. We're getting sick of beans too. It's so hard to keep going when that's the primary food we have to eat. Penelope wanted to groan aloud at the mere mention of beans, but as she was the one who brought them up, she didn't think that would be exactly appropriate. I can understand that. Here's what I do. Penelope took careful mental notes of everything Margaret said. She wanted to be a better cook for Herb. She wanted to be better at everything for Herb. He'd done so much for her, she had to be the best wife she could in return. Perhaps I could come over some evening and help you cook. I think I'd learn a lot that way if you don't mind. Penelope loved the idea of working alongside Margaret. Perhaps if she was better at cooking, it wouldn't feel like such a chore to her. I forgot you didn't cook before this journey. I would be very happy to teach you everything I know. Amanda, Margaret's older daughter, turned around and looked at Penelope. Mama's the best cook in all the world. Penelope laughed. 
I just had someone tell me that she was going to be the best cook in all the world. She'll never be better than my mama. Amanda shook her head adamantly. Margaret laughed. She might. Maybe you should try other people's cooking. Amanda shook her head. No, I only want to eat yours. What's your favorite food? Margaret asked Penelope. Penelope thought about it. Chicken and dumplings. Our cook made them for me at least once a week. Margaret smiled. I wonder if we could get our hands on a pullet from one of the people who brought chickens along. Or we could talk Mary into getting a bird for us. That woman could shoot anything with one hand tied behind her back and her eyes closed. Trudy frowned. I need to meet this Mary. If you haven't already, you really do need to, Penelope said. She's very good at hunting, cooking, and a million other things. I'm very intimidated by her at times, but I'm so glad she taught me to shoot. Margaret smiled. There's no one better to teach you to shoot. I see you have your pistol on you. Have you heard anything else? Penelope shook her head. I think he's probably checking the companies behind us, and he will hopefully be back after that. I don't want to think about it while we're having fun at our dance, though. Trudy looked at her. That man who was looking for you? You think he's coming back? Penelope sighed, wishing everyone would let her forget about it for the evening so she could enjoy herself. He was sent by my father, who was angry I left. I'm sure he's coming back. My father wouldn't let him come back to Virginia without me. I had no idea. Trudy shook her head. I'm so sorry. It's all right. I just hope I'm not putting others in danger by staying here. It doesn't matter if you are, Trudy said. You're going to stay safe with us, so you can go to Oregon and open that dress shop. I love the work you did on Emily's dress. Penelope smiled. I'm rather proud of it. I do love to sew. Do you love mending? Margaret asked. Of course. If I can stick a needle into it, then I love doing it. I may be trading some mending for some cooking lessons sometime soon then. Margaret looked excited at the prospect of avoiding her mending. Give me a time and I will be there. Trudy smiled. Not me. I can cook already. You can? Penelope asked. I can. I'm a very good cook. Trudy shrugged. I was a cook for a wealthy family back east for a time. It was the most Trudy had said about her past, and Penelope filed the information away. She wanted to ask questions about it, but she knew better. If Trudy was going to stay her friend, Penelope had to accept the information she was willing to give and not ask for more. Herb got to his feet and held his hand out for Penelope's. I've waited while you've chattered, woman, but I'm ready for my dance with you. Penelope got to her feet with a big smile. As long as I get to be held in your arms, I'll be very content. He held her hand as he led her to the dance floor. She happily went into his arms and moved close. In Virginia, if a couple danced this way, there were rumors she was pregnant within a week. Do you mind that sort of rumor? he asked, smiling. Not when I'm very obviously married to you. Beside them, Penelope noticed that girl, Edna, with her peppermint stick in her cleavage dancing some strange dance, by herself. Her arms were outstretched to the sky, and she was spinning in a very odd way. Penelope liked how free she felt to be herself. She obviously hadn't been brought up with the same strict rules as Penelope had. After the dance was over, the band played a wilder tune, and Herb surprised her by keeping her on the dance floor and continuing to dance with her. No, it wasn't a dance she'd ever heard of or seen before, but it was quite fun, and he was spinning her around in ways that had her laughing. When they finally sat down fifteen minutes later, Trudy and Margaret were still talking. Don't you ever dance? Trudy asked Margaret. Margaret smiled. 
When everyone is playing, Jamie makes sure we get one dance per night. But someone hasn't been doing his share, and Jamie's had to stay up there the whole time. Herb laughed. You're not going to make me feel guilty for protecting my wife. He put his arm around Penelope's shoulders, hugging her to him. Penelope smiled at their banter, glad the two of them were so comfortable talking to each other that way. We miss you at supper every night as well, Mr. Jensen. Your new wife is keeping you from being with the rest of the camp. But since my new wife is your friend, you don't mind at all, do you? No, I really don't, Margaret said. Though I wouldn't mind a dance with my husband on occasion. Herb looked around him. You'll both stay with Penelope? I'll go get my fiddle for one song. Margaret looked at her friend and back at Herb. I don't think you should leave her. I was just joking. I'll send Mary over. Mary and Bob were doing a wild dance in the middle of the dance floor, as usual, and everyone was giving her a wide berth. It might be best for everyone if you make those two sit out a dance or two, Penelope said. Do they always dance that way? They do, Margaret said as Herb hurried off to tap Bob on the shoulder and tell him what was needed. Mary and Bob joined them and sat down. I don't have my musket, Mary whispered. No, but I have your pistol, Penelope said. Well, give it to me, so I can do my duty as protector of the weak. I'm not weak. Penelope wanted that to be clear. There was safety in numbers, definitely, but she didn't need to be watched over like a child. Mary looked at Penelope and nodded. I know you're not. I was just being silly. Penelope introduced Mary and Trudy. Trudy is the only other woman who was brave enough to join our company, to go west with no one with her. Then you're not weak either, Mary said to Trudy. I'm aware, Trudy said. She didn't smile at Mary, but Mary didn't seem to mind. As soon as Herb walked to the other musicians, Jamie set down his instrument and walked to Margaret. May I have this dance, my love? You may. Margaret took Jamie's hand and headed out to the middle of their makeshift dance floor, and she went into his arms. I like watching Herb play, Penelope said softly to Trudy. I've only seen him play back in Independence, but he's really good. Why am I surprised? As far as she could tell, Herb was good at everything he did. I have no idea, Trudy said. I think all of the musicians are good. I used to sit at my campfire and listen and wish people wanted me to join in the dancing. I don't know why you thought you weren't welcome. Penelope frowned at her friend. I just did, Trudy said softly. She obviously wasn't going to explain anything more, so Penelope let the subject drop. Margaret and Jamie look so happy dancing together, don't they? Penelope asked. Trudy nodded. They do. They're still newlyweds, Mary said. Sometimes it feels like half the company is newly married, and it's fun to see. It does, doesn't it? Penelope asked. It's different now that I am a newlywed and not on the outside, looking into all the fun. For a while I felt like everyone was at an exclusive party, surrounded by glass. I was allowed to look inside the party, but I wasn't allowed to enter. Not until I married anyway. I'm sorry we made you feel that way, Mary said. That was never anyone's intention. I know it wasn't. But now that I'm married, it does feel good to be included in everything. I'm happy to be part of this big group of people who will be living together somewhere in Oregon. Penelope knew she would always have friends around her, and that's what she needed. I'm excited to settle in, Trudy said softly. Do you have any idea where? Mary shrugged. I have no idea about any of it. I just know we're doing it. Penelope sighed as she watched the musicians play. Now that she was part of the group, she never wanted to leave it.